Hey everybody, this is George Ortega. This is the Free Will Science and Religion Podcast. We're here with Gary Mosher, David Joseph, Trick Slattery, and Chandler Klebs. And on this episode, we're going to be discussing two themes primarily. Um, we here on the call are comfortable being conscious puppets, conscious robots, and, and, and we understand that absolutely nothing we do is up to us. We're fine with that. Most people aren't. We're going to try to figure out how to help people come to terms with this fact of reality. The second theme we're going to um, explore on the show is like, basically, there's a certain understanding of Daniel Wegner wrote an entire book on it called The Illusion of Conscious Will. It's the idea that we make um, decisions consciously where the, the evidence seems to point to the fact that our decisions are made unconsciously, and then we become aware of them or conscious of them. And that's another reason why we, you know, actually don't have a free will. All right, let's, let's start out, guys, with, with the first theme. How can we get people to feel comfortable, you know, just like understanding that absolutely nothing they do is up to them? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that is kind of a tough question. But uh, you can still feel proud of being what you are, okay? The fact that you didn't do it doesn't change the fact that you are it. So you're, you're getting the... You're having, I, I don't have to make the car, right? If I, if I have a Maserati, I don't have to make the Maserati to feel proud to be driving it, right? So in a sense, I can still value what I am. I can still say I came out good. I can still be grateful that I'm not a jerk or something. So, I mean, you can still, you can still have a sense of pride as an animal, you know, that needs to feel good about yourself. You can still feel like you're well, you know, but that also creates obligation because obviously now you have the thing where it's not though like I earned it. So, you know, maybe the people who don't have Maseratis, I got to drive a little slower so they don't feel intimidated. You know, <laughs> hey, I have a great example um, of how I'm still happy with what I experience at my job, even though I realize it's not up to me realizing that like basically I'm just doing what I'm told. I, I don't write my schedule. I don't do what I'm. I, I just do what the customers tell me, what the employees, the managers tell me. I'm just doing what they say. Um, so I'm I'm not making any effort to. I'm you know that's the thing is I'm not even making the so-called decisions that people talk about, which are those decisions are causal anyway. But I get paid for the time I work there. And I get off work, and I get a buffet, and I eat granola, and it tastes good. So who cares whether it was up to me what I did at my job? <laughs> All right, well, Chandler, um, who, Chandler, what I would say to that is like some people might want, want might say to themselves, "Well, yeah, but like you know, let's say you do your job well. Don't 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 you want to feel?" proud that you did it well and gary i think you answered this correctly so like you know you go from the, the feeling of of this boastful pride of look what i did to like this gratitude look you know like i am so lucky that the universe has allowed me to do this job well so you know in other words like yeah because like the free will belief the free will belief makes us either insecure when when we can't do things um, well, and we blame ourselves, and we, we kind of like think other people are better, or if we do things better than others, it makes us arrogant and conceited and boastful. So both, both perspectives uh, create separations between other people and ourselves, and also both um, uh, the, 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 when we don't succeed, that feels that, that, that hurts, and when we, when we succeed, it, it may feel good, but again, it's the it's expense of our relationships. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think you kind of said it there just with the word uh, gratitude and pride. Both are, are good feelings. So, I mean, what's the difference of whether you feel grateful or proud? You might as well just go with the grateful thing. And that'll give you maybe a little bit of humility, which is also, although it's sort of a negative feeling, it's also a very positive one when you can feel good about being good. You know, so it's kind of a neat word in the sense that you can start feeling good about the good you do, which is even, you know, which is another way to drive some self-respect and self-esteem and just recognizing that you're capable of making changes in how you interact with people that'll be positive in their life and that is essentially makes you more valuable again yeah exactly. and i feel very i guess you could say that i feel grateful or lucky or whatever you want to call it fortunate you know like i feel good about who i am and what i do and, and i and yet i have that understanding that I don't like deserve 
anything, good or bad. Like, I don't feel as though that there's any negative thing to this understanding at all. Because I, because I don't, I no longer take things so personally and feel like feel like a failure. Like, because even when I fail at something I was trying to do or what somebody expects me to do, I still realize, well, wait, it's not my fault to be in the situation because my own existence was not my, was not my choice. You know what I'm saying? Well, and so I guess that understanding. <laughs> I think self-assessment is still a possibility even without a, a free will. So, I mean, I don't have to be free to still be assessing my Lamborghini. Again, I don't have to make the thing to make sure it runs well and to wax it and to do all that kind of stuff. So, I, I still have an oblig. I still feel a sense of, I mean, failure is still important in the sense that even though I'm a machine, I want to be a really great machine. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. it's, we're Regardless programmed to want to be a good we're, machine. You know, yeah, exactly. I kind of want to have that program because I know that program of waxing the car is going to lead to the car lasting longer and being better and all that kind of stuff. I mean, the maintenance is important, and I know that part of the maintenance is that self-assessment. And so I, I find that sort of a, 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 a that will to improve is just kind of the nature of the beast is that that I don't think that competitiveness goes away when you become a machine. It just you just change the way you're thinking about it. I'm still going to think of myself as a self. I'm still going to want to be proud of myself rather than ashamed of myself. All right. So um, trick. So basically, we've been dealing with the credit worthiness, blame worthiness aspect of this. But like people, you know, my understanding is people uh, find it difficult to accept that they don't have a free will because they feel, well, you know, if I don't have a free, free will, what's the point of, every, of anything? You know, I'm just going along for the ride. Nothing is up to me. How do you answer that? I think it's a mistaken thinking um, about causality. And um, so, so what it is is th it's a difference between fatalism and determinism, uh, which people conflate all the time. Uh, fatalism basically means that uh, there's some end thing that's going to happen that, that – your causal influence has nothing to do with, but um, determinism means that there's a, there's a process that leads to that that state, and and you're part of that process. So, um, uh, and, and when we think about things like knowledge and learning and and things like that, those those are causal processes. And when people don't understand this, they don't understand that that causality is actually necessary for these things, for all these things that are good that we consider good such as learning, logic, for example. Um, yeah, well, we're educated through experience, right? So you just all you're really basically saying is that if you have the right ingredients, the right experiences, the conclusion will be inevitable. So, yeah, at any point, I can change somebody by changing their experience. So I give them an experience, and that experience will change their their programming. Yeah. You know? Right, exactly. I think, I think they have to look positively on this whole causal process, basically. So, so they have to look at that as, as something, it's not, it's not a negative thing that we're causally influenced to do what we do, because that causal influence is the thing that causes all the uh, knowledge that we have, and all the learning, and all the steps that lead to the next steps. All right, but Trick, I mean, I could say to that, that like, well, fine, you know, like, in other words, like, I'm part of this causal chain of why I do what I do and what I actually do, but I'm still no more than a puppet. In other words, like, a, you know, a puppet is part of the ca causal chain, you know, the, the strings move the arms or whatever, and the puppet does what it does, but the puppet has absolutely no control over what it does. I mean, like, how do you answer that concern? Well, it, it, you're right. I mean, it doesn't have you don't have the control over what you do because they, they, it comes out through that causal process. But that doesn't mean the puppet necessarily leads to something well, well, negative. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that question is inevitably, yeah, I think it can lead to a lot of negative in the sense that it does impose this heightened responsibility because I think it automatically just says to you, yes, every, this is all something we're creating. Like, we're responsible for what exists. We're not just, you know, we, we're saying we're not, we, we, we can evade responsibility for what we are, but you've got to understand you can't do it. You can't have it both ways. You can't evade responsibility for everything. So if you're going to say you're part of this chain of stuff, then you're going to recognize that you're creating the next link. So in a way, you're making the future. And so that does heighten your – I mean, it's not going to be good news. It's not going to be good news to know, well, you know what? You're supposed to be out there fixing all these broken programs. I mean, there's a lot of people with broken programs. They need fixing right now. You better get to work. So – 
you know, it does heighten a sense of, wow, this is a daunting responsibility I'm caught up with because no matter how my little grain of sand, it's actually going to influence the storm. You know, my one fish in the school of fish can change the direction of the entire school of fish. And having that sense of knowledge does kind of give you a, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a defeating sense of responsibility because now in a way, every, you know, you might be, the, you, Hitler might be your fault. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. David, David, so like you're kind of new to this like realization that, um, that, you don't have a free will. No one has a free will. You know, so like, how have you been making sense of it? How, how do you think about it in a way that, that you're, you accept it and you're comfortable with it? Uh, I kind of think along the lines of, uh, I can say, I'm not sure why I did something, but I can be glad that I did it. Or I can, I can be okay with the fact that I did it. So it's just kind of accepting that, you know, it wasn't me who ultimately created that situation. Oh, but, but then, Right. So in other words, like, so you're, you're saying when you do something good, you're grateful. And when you do something bad, you're more forgiving. Right. Um, pr- I think pr- it's pr- pretty I, much. Yeah. Yeah. Along those lines. Definitely. I right, think but it's, then, oh, hold on. Right. So, but then how do you how do you address the control thing? Fine. Like we feel grateful when we do um, good. You know, we don't really blame ourselves when we do bad, whatever. But how do you address the control factor? In other words, like basically a lot of people find this hard to accept because like we're just like actors in a movie absolutely nothing is up to us right we're like we're like the uh, the passengers just along for the ride kind of thing exactly so how, how do you come to terms with that um very difficult to eat yeah honest. drinking was, drinking yeah <laughs> yeah. Drugs, yeah, anyway. <laughs> yeah i mean that's what i just mean george it's sort of a dangerous question because once you get into this idea then then i think it is reasonable for some people to say this is a silly redundancy. I, I mean, we just keep making these dumb machines so they can live out their dumb little stupid lives and then die. I mean, it is kind of a silly story when you start looking at it that I way. I know, but that's the saying, humor of it. <laughs> you know, yeah, let's clean up the mess once and be done with it already. You know, why keep making these daffy ducks that you have to keep repairing all the time? You know, and that's all. We're, we're just, you know, we're just kind of silly little... Right. Let me, let me let me explain to you how I deal with it because like all right and this is also um, in consideration that 80 90 percent of people here in the United States maybe in England also believe no I think a bit less in England but believe in God or higher power so basically what I tell people in my meetups uh, in Manhattan stuff I, we discuss this all the time I say to people well you know like if you believe in free will you're this little person going around this huge planet just doing whatever you want to do. And then I, I bring the example. How about if, if, like, if President Obama or God or some major authority was telling you what they wanted you to do every moment of the day, so you went out throughout your days doing whatever you did, not in the service of your tiny little will, but in the service of, let's say, God. So, so in other words, like, basically what I tell people is, like, we're not manifesting our wills as, as human beings. We're mas- manifesting the will. Now, and now I'm a pantheist, so like to me, God and the universe are synonymous. We're manifesting the will of the universe or God. How does that sound as, as a way to reach those people? I, I, well, I, I kind of say no sale because I'm, I just have <laughs> real passion for the truth and logic, and there's nothing. The, the universe is an idiot, so I don't really want an idiot telling me what to do because the universe is an idiot. <laughs> so. Yeah, well, you know, here's the deal, George. Um, I think to some people that appeals. I don't know why yet it appeals to people because it doesn't to right. me. But, um, but like, I, I don't know. I, I've noticed, though, that when people are in a religion, they tend to want – they want they like the belief that it's not up to them, but it's up to God or something. They, some people like that perhaps because it removes that feeling of responsibility from them, and they don't want that feeling of responsibility. But you don't need to turn to a religion to be free from that fundamental responsibility that so many people are damaged by. Yeah, the truth is a great. I mean, you know, if I could just respell God as truth, right? That's all I care, right? The the word is the truth and all that. I mean, I just like the idea of just recognizing there's nothing more beautiful than a perfectly spoken sentence of, you know, definitive acute accuracy. Yes. <laughs> you know, I mean, yes. You no, know, a wonderful definition is a wonderful thing, right? So, yeah, that's that's good. That's enough God for me. Okay, yeah. Trick, what was your take on it? What what was your perspective? On, on the God thing, yeah, or, or saying thinking that the universe is well, I think I think it confuses people. That's that's my my biggest problem with it. I think it I think it lets them think that the universe is something 
more than it really is, something more intelligent or, or whatnot. When it, when it, like like Gary said, it, it's a stupid universe that yeah that yeah. Just let's kind of admit, the, you know, God is kind of like nicotine, right? Let's just yeah try to get off it all together. You know, I mean, don't do this vaping thing and everything. Yeah, no, 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 no. You know, try to stop it out all. The, yeah, it's like smallpox. But, you know, but try, I, try, try yeah. to exterminate it. You know, right? Don't remake it. Just get rid of it, man. But it's, but at the same that, time, George. The at the same time, George, I understand. Like, I do understand where, where you're coming from. Where, where a lot of people are religious, so so it, it, it they they need baby steps, basically. And sometimes you need to put it in those types of terms for those baby steps to take place. But but I think I, it, those baby steps, we don't want to confuse people on on it as as we take those steps. You know right. What well, I mean? here's yeah trick here. One of our challenges is like. I don't think we're going to like – I think we'll succeed in getting people to to accept that they don't have a free will before we succeed in getting people to, to believe there's no God, right? But the challenge is like as soon as like people begin to understand that what we do is not up to us and they still believe in God, then the first thing that comes to their mind is, oh my God, when we do evil, the evil of Hitler, of Mao Tung, of Stalin and all, this is all God's will. So in other words, like – you know. With the idea that we don't have free will to religious, you know, God believers comes the realization that God is not all good. God is not this beloved. God can be extremely evil also. How do we address that? Yeah, well, I think it's still dangerous because I think it kind of gets almost nihilistic or something. And I just don't, you know, I, I still just say, look, the truth is the truth. And that's the part I'm working towards is that the truth is the way all that, you know, just, let's use those kind of religious phrases and understand that. The truth is the light, you know, all that kind of stuff. I mean, the truth is the game. So we got to be, to have integrity, to have any, you know, as machines, to have self-respect, we got to do the chess program properly, right? We can't be playing bingo when we're supposed to be playing chess. So I'm just saying we got to get with the program here. And the program is we're sentient beings. It's the most valuable thing. It's the most precious thing in the universe is this idea of a conscious sentient being. Let's value it. Let's, let's do the right thing. And that's all I really, that's, that's the beginning and end of my conversation in a sense. I just want people to gravitate to the idea of recognizing that the truth is the value, not mystical unicorns or gods or anything else. Right. And, and they get us into the whole idea of ethics or morality without free will, which is probably a, a totally different topic that we should discuss at some later time. Um, but yeah, I, I agree with Gary. I mean, uh, it's, it's all about the value. That evaluation or, or value actually that's happening, the intrinsic value that's happening at the time that it's happening. Um, and we need to causally affect people in a way that they recognize the value and they, they lead their own action, which, which it's not them leading it, but the causal, causality of us uh, and our prior causality and the whole chain of events that would hopefully lead people to acting ethical. So, so it's a, a forward-looking ethic. All right, all right. So we've got about 12 minutes left. So I think we've dealt with this, you know, enough for now. Let's get into something that's really complicated. Complicated not just for uh, most people, for us. Basically, the idea, like, for example, that Daniel Wegner put forth in his book, again, 2002, called The Illusion of Conscious Will, is that we don't actually ever decide anything consciously. Con our consciousness is just a perceiver, an observer. It, it, it's aware of, of all the action that's actually happening in the unconscious. Let me just quickly go through why this has to be so. Basically, you know, when we make a decision, it's based on data. It's based on the words we know, the principles we know, the concepts, what we have, you know, stored in our memory. Now, all this storage isn't in our conscious mind because our conscious mind is limited to awareness. When we're conscious, we're aware. So that means all the data by which we decide is stored in the unconscious. Now, if the data is stored in the unconscious, and by definition, the unconscious is the part of the mind that we're not aware of, then the processing of that data must also be in the unconscious. Because, again, that unconscious is the only part of our mind that has access. That's where the, the data is to, to decide. So if right. you have the data and the processing of the decisions happening in the unconscious, that means that then all the activity is happening at the level of the unconscious. And we're not aware of it. We're not in control of it. And then this consciousness is simply our being aware of what the unconscious is allows us to be aware of because a lot of times it does stuff it doesn't even allow us to be aware of it what do you guys think so, so is, yeah, is well, that well, kind of like being um like uh sleepwalking but being yes 
That's, yeah, a, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great analogy. I, I would metaphor. There's lots of ways to metaphor it, but I, I would metaphor it as it's like, let's say there's two streams, okay? There's the stream of reality that comes through your senses, and so that's processed into a stream, and your brain has this idea of creating a sensation or creating a, you know, turning the image in your eye upside down and fixing it and all that stuff. And so there's that stream. And then there's the stream of your synthetic reality that your brain always has. It has a model of reality inside your memory. And so that's another stream. And it basically just takes those two streams and collides them together in your consciousness. And so your consciousness is the splash, but it's not doing anything. It's just the splash. It's just what happens when you combine your your mental model with reality. So reality collides with your mental model and you have this interaction and the interaction will be cause and action in the sense the water will fall down and come out as your output. But, right, it's, but so, so there's processing on all these streams, but the processing isn't where you're seeing it and all you're seeing is where they collide and mix. But we do have to understand, I guess, uh, I, I, and I agree with the, uh, what you guys are saying here, uh, you know, consciousness basically outputs I'm sorry, subconscious processes output our conscious experience, basically. But uh, what happens is once we get that conscious experience, it tends to um, strengthen uh, synapses in the brain. So, so, so it has its own causal process. So it's not, it's I not something that that's I, I, I still, external I was, from... from that's yeah, a good I mean, point. You're not, you're not consciously good doing point. that. You know, you're not sitting there saying, okay, I'm going to now consciously create right. some synopsis. So I exactly. mean, clearly exactly. that's all unconscious behavior and, right. and but, you're but, the byproduct of that. I, I still would argue that it's, it's the more sensible view of your consciousness is to just see yourself sitting in a theater and you didn't make the theater, you're not doing the play, you're just a witness to the, the, ad, the what's going to take place. Your mental model and the players and the other script readers are all going to create your experience and you're just going to watch it. You're not going to there's, there's not your consciousness doesn't have any strings. See, I, I it doesn't pull anything. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't shoot anything. It doesn't say anything. It's just a victim of the process. I think the watching part, the watching of the process, actually leads to the next set of processes. Uh, so, but so that's it's, the same. So that's the same input as your input that gave you the sensations of light right. and and vision and all that stuff. So that stuff's all right. unconscious. I'm not processing what I see, my eye focus, I don't consciously focus my sight, right? I mean, my sight does, you know, my brain's well, doing that. So right, well, to avoid something, to avoid an object flying at you, you, you are, you're processing it, you're seeing the object, you're, you're, you're consciously oh, seeing the object. It's all reflexes, though, come on. It's, 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 yeah, but, but it's not reflexes, it's reflexes I'm, based on just, the consciousness. Yeah, I know, but you're not consciously doing any of that. Your your brain is just rebuilding your mental model with new experiences. Right, I, you, get to, you get to see a tiny bit of it doing a little bit of writing on the paper, but you're not writing trick, on it. Trick, trick, I, I think it's writing. Right, trick. I think what Gary is saying is like, yes, our consciousness, for example, is used by our unconscious to strengthen the connections, you know, to make the connections, you know. Right. But but I think Gary's point is like that the, it's the unconscious that's directing the consciousness to be conscious of whatever it's conscious of. So in other words, the un, the con, our consciousness is still always under the direction and control of our unconscious. Well, it's it's both. It's 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 it's, it's all one process. There's no there's no distinction between. So you have the sub the subconscious that leads to the conscious, which leads to the subconscious. So it's all a causal process. But but all of them are part of the whole. Uh, causality. There's, there's, it's not like the consciousness is something that we're putting to the side, um, and, yeah. and then we're just. Yeah, you know, well, I, I just yeah. fundamentally disagree. I, I think yeah. the consciousness is completely superfluous to the function, and you could do entirely without it if it wasn't oh, for the creation hey, of this hey, thing I called the sensation. You know, if it was sensations <laughs> are why we're conscious, and it's and that's really the only reason. All our thoughts are really just creations of our brain and subconsciously. There's no conscious function. But, but yeah, even, sen I, even sensation is conscious. So so like yeah. you said, pain like pain it or falls into it. it. Like ingredients fall into a bowl. I mean, the consciousness is a bowl. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there to con to hold the parts. It just isn't. No, no. It, it has the machine. It, it's the it, bowl of the blender. It doesn't do any of the work. It has an important part to the machine. It, uh, 
paint well, has important parts. A bowl. Of our a bowl. You don't think of a bowl as being doing any of the work. It's not stirring. It's not an ingredient. It's not anything. It's just a superfluous byproduct of the fact that you have to put Chandler the in I something. All right, Chandler. Let yeah. Chandler go ahead. Yes. Go ahead I Chandler. Had, yeah, I had some things to say about consciousness because you know consciousness is awareness, and in order to be aware of something. You, would, you have to have some senses like sight, hearing, smell, taste, and feeling like the five physical senses everyone talks about. So someone could say, well, a person who's blind um, obviously is less conscious in the area of sight than someone who has sight. And therefore, they, because they don't have the consciousness of an object that's flying in the other direction, well, they can't avoid it because they're not conscious of it and that's why i agree with trick more because yes this awareness this consciousness which comes through our physical senses really is just as part of the machine as any other part and so i think of the consciousness and unconsciousness they can't really be separated you can't just put consciousness right. to the side david i know you're kind of new to this I'm, you, you probably haven't thought about this theme as much as we have and all but what's your take on it so far what 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 what, what do you believe happens um, so far, I'm kind of uh, – it's going over my head a bit, to be honest with you. At first, I agreed with Gary, and uh, then I just heard Chandler. So now I'm kind of agreeing with Trick, but I'm still not sure. I need uh, I need diagrams and pictures for this. <laughs> okay. I, I, well, I, I just um, think understand it, the biology. I just think you, know, you have to understand how the brain was evolved. And I, I, like I said, I just think this is a necessary function to create value. Value was the key thing the brain was synthesizing. And this is the mechanism it came on. It ended up creating real value, and real value requires an ouch and all that stuff. You can't do an ouch in in some synthetic space. You have to have a you have to have sentience consciousness to create ouch, and that's why we have uh, feeling senses. Our senses are real to us because they're feeling. And I would just make a real quick thing. Everybody knows what muscle memory is, right? So our output is all muscle memory. It's not conscious, right? Our reflexes. Well, there's muscle memory coming in. Are, you know, what comes in is also doing exactly the same thing. So the input is being interpreted in a mechanical way based on those reflexes. So it's reflexes in, reflexes out. Consciousness is just the mirror that the reflexes are bouncing off of. Yeah, I, I, I was like trying to defend consciousness in terms of communication. I, I had a theory that I put in my first book saying that, well, we need consciousness in order to be able to communicate our thoughts to other people. But then, like, I was in a forum, somebody, like, made the, the very astute comment is, like, well, we don't know. Absolutely. Computers communicate with each other all the time, and they're not conscious. So my take now is that, like, conscious is an ep consciousness is an epiphenomenon that basically our mind could do everything it needed to do, including perceiving pain, feeling pain and all, without our being conscious of this perception of pain. So, I, I you know… I, I, don't, I don't think that's possible. See, that's where I'm saying I don't think they could ever create an AI that would have real pain without having real pain. It, it creates an, an urgency. An urgency is a tricky thing to create even in a pro, computer program. Well, yeah, a computer what, program what, what I'm just saying, it. it could just evade it. You know what I mean? Right, you have but, to make something that can't evade. In, in psychology, sometimes, like, for example, people are in pain, but they're not aware they're in pain. They may be angry or they may be, like, that, like depressed or something, but they're not aware of it. So in other words, like, what I'm saying is, like, at the I level would, of the unconscious. that pain then. So I think that's uh, – we have a vocabulary problem. Right. So, exactly. So in other words, like, um, let's say there's the, the neurochemistry, the neurobiology that's happening, like, um, that would be the, the blueprint of pain. And let's say it's not – you know, be felt consciously, but let's say it's uh, it's making the body behave in certain ways. You know, so that that would that would I think constitute the. Um, That's what I meant by the two streams, though, right? I mean, your brain is just it, your its reaction to the world is to create a sensation, not necessarily pain, but it can be some sort of attraction or repulsion, right? Some attractive or repulsive sensation, and then your brain schemes to solve the pain problem. It schemes to solve the desire problem. So your right. brain is being used to – it creates a synthetic creation of this sensation that has value attached to it, and now it can solve a value problem. Where if we were just a computer in space, the computer would say, there's no problems. All right. We, we've got about, we got about 40 seconds left. Now, so I, I, 
this theme is excellent because like you know like the, the theme of causality you know cause and effect makes free will impossible a causality makes free will impossible that's too simple we get this all right whereas like the consciousness unconscious connection to why free will is impossible it's much more interesting because it's much more complex we got to do a lot more shows about this all right thanks everybody gary david trick chandler this is uh george ortega for exploring illusion free for, <laughs> for uh, free will science and uh, religion. We will be back, you know, to explore this and other concepts. We're going to try to do like a, a podcast every 